LDF has been in this fight, the fight that is at the center of Mumia's case since the beginning. We are committed to the elimination of racial discrimination and the, and the role of race in the administration of the criminal justice system and in the administration of the death penalty, period. It is, it is, it is what I do. That is the job that I do. So it was an easy ask when it came up. Could we come into this case? Should we come into this case? Um, it was easy for us to say clearly, this is the most important case, the most important death penalty case, and we have to come into this case. Right on. We came in because we know that justice remains elusive for Mumia, just like it does for countless other African American men on death row in this country, because race plays a role in the administration of criminal justice and in capital punishment. We did it because we know that race dictates who lives and who dies in this country. History shows it, research shows it, and a lot of other evidence shows it. I think it's impossible to even begin to look at this case, to think about this case, to understand what's happening in this case without understanding the history of the death penalty in this country and understanding the origins of the death penalty in this country. We have to know and we have to understand that the death penalty in this country is a direct descendant of slavery. I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about that history because I just want everyone to be clear and this is why LDF is so committed to the struggle and so firmly committed to the view that you, there is no way to talk about the death penalty without talking about race. Those two things cannot be untangled. They are forever tied together in this country. The death penalty is the child of slavery. It is the child of this country's darkest days of racial slavery and segregation. It was and is a legal way to use violence to control and oppress the descendants of African Americans. Violence, of course, was the central means of controlling and maintaining slavery in this country. There was no other way that this country could keep thousands and thousands and millions and millions of African Americans, of black, of Africans um, in control without using absolute brute force. And that's what it did. Uh, slavery was brutal and that a period. The violence was rampant. Black lives had no value under slavery. After the Civil War ended, Violence continued to be a primary weapon against African Americans in this country in order to maintain the socioeconomic status quo. In the post-war reconstruction period, the southern states were required to accept the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, and the 14th Amendment, which granted blacks constitutional rights as citizens, as conditions of entry into the Union, back into the United States. And during that time, as you know, progressive coalitions of African Americans and whites worked together and ran southern states. They enacted significant civil rights legislation, and during that time, black people began slowly to make gains coming out of slavery. Despite the fact that blacks were significant minorities in all of the southern states outside of South, South Carolina, this progress was, was extremely resented by the southern whites. This hostility was undoubtedly a product of a lot of things, but most primarily because the southern states were economically dependent on the labor provided by black people in the south. And so to the extent that African Americans progressed, that social structure, that economic structure was jeopardized. So because keeping black people in their place, in the most controlled place, put kindly, but, uh, the white southerners um, had to find a way to thwart the reconstruction progress. And that is how the Klan and other terrorist organizations were born. 
During the time of Reconstruction, the Klan and other terrorist organizations emerged and embarked on a campaign of murdering and terrorizing black people and progressive whites who were working with them. Ultimately, they were successful, and the Southern whites took control of the South. They changed the laws, imposed racial segregation and disfranchisement, and shoved black people back into the lowest rungs of society and, and essentially recreated slavery in a different name for many years. The violence didn't end with the reinstallation of Southern white leaders, however, because again, you needed to, they needed the economic support system that free labor, poor free black labor provided. And so the violence continued. The boundaries between African Americans and whites were enforced by brutal mob terror lynching and race riots. Between 1882 and 1968, 1,297 white people were lynched. 3,445 black people were lynched in the United States. That's over 100 people a year, mostly black, were lynched between 1882 and the turn of the century. This continued. The only reason the rate of lynching started to abate was when the southern states started to adopt the death penalty. The death penalty became a legal lynching. So the 100 per year rate of lynchings in the south were replaced by a similar number of death sentences that began to be meted out in the 1930s. And I would need to be very clear about this because there were instances, numerous instances, where judges would simply come out of courthouses and tell gathering lynch mobs, you don't have to worry because I'm going to do what you need me to do. There is going to be a death sentence here. And so they, had, they were able to avoid the unseemly spectacle, what became an unseemly spectacle of lynching by imposing death sentences. The racial disparities in the administration of the death penalty in the early years bears this out. 89% of those who were executed for the crime of rape between 1930 and 1972 were black. That is simply social control. Black men should not get out of place and shouldn't speak to or think of speaking to a white woman or they were going to be lynched one way or another. The link between lynchings and the death penalty can still be seen today. The states with a significant history of lynching also have the higher number of death sentences today. So these two things are bound together. And so it's important to understand that history when you ask yourself why it would be that an outspoken African American man, a critic of the police, and an advocate for communities of color in Philadelphia in 1981 wound up being capitally prosecuted and sentenced to death. Because the death penalty, as Michelle Alexander's book describes very eloquently, is a, is a, is a weapon of social control and that has always been. Race plays out today. We know that black people make up 12% of the population. We are 41% of all condemned prisoners in the United States. Researchers have looked really closely at why is this happening? Why is it that black people are so disproportionately represented among those on death row? They've compared cases, black defendants and white defendants, with similar facts, and repeatedly, time and again, study after study has showed that it is race, not the terribleness of the crime, not the background of the offender, not the circumstances of the victim. It is race that is the most significant factor that it creates a likelihood of getting a death sentence. In fact, a study in Philadelphia itself showed black defendants face odds of receiving the death penalty four times greater than similarly situated white defendants. Again in Philadelphia, another study showed that black defendants with more stereotypically black features, darker skin, a broader nose, are more likely to get the death penalty in Philadelphia if they have a white victim. That researcher called that phenomenon looking death worthy. So Mumia, this case is just an extension of this cultural phenomenon that derives from slavery and from lynching that links race to criminality, to violence, to human worthlessness, a perception of human worthlessness. We know that race also plays a role when you look at the victims in, in capital cases. Black people are half of murder victims in this country nationwide. Half of all murder victims in this country are African American. 
14, 1-4% of, of the victims of those who have been executed were black. 14. 14. So unless there's some reason to believe that white people are killed in more gruesome ways, by worse people, by some set of facts that bears no sense and logic and there is no research to bear it out, it means that decision makers are making value judgments about the lives of black victims relative to white victims. It means they're saying that white victims, the, the offenders who kill allegedly white victims are worse than the offenders who kill black victims. That Again, black lives are not worth as much as white lives. And then you have to think about who is deciding at the end of the day who gets sentenced to death. Most of the people who, most of the decision makers in death cases are juries. There's a second phase of the trial where a jury is uh, asked to look at only the question of whether a person who's been convicted of capital murder should live or should die. And we know from all of the cases that I've litigated and almost all of them and, and through my colleagues across the country, the prosecutors take great pains in this country to make sure that African Americans do not get the opportunity to participate in that decision. They use the power that they have to, to exclude prospective jurors on racial, on racial grounds. And we know this happened in Philadelphia because there was a videotape of a training session in Philadelphia where the prosecutor explained in exquisite detail to his, his, his colleagues how they could and should go about making sure that black people did not get seated on juries. And we know that happened in Mumia's case. So where, do we, where does that leave us? It means that at the end of the day, what we have was Mumia Abu-Jamal in 1981. Before he went on trial, the newspaper coverage was all about race. They talked about Mumia's affiliations with various African-American organizations, with MOVE, the Black Panther Party, the National Association of Black Journalists. We know they went on at length about his high school involvement in, in political advocacy. They went out of their way to talk about how Mumia worked for black media outlets and focused on issues that were important to African Americans. They talked about his hair, how he wore it in dreadlocks. I'm going to quote one article from before the trial. Several prospective jurors left the courtroom Tuesday saying they were too upset and afraid to serve after being questioned by Abu Jamal, who wears his hair in the dreadlock style of the move sect. Uh -oh. I don't even, well, I don't. They went on to comment that he was interested in Rastafarianism, that he was born Wesley Cook, but he changed his name. That African Americans had formed a defense fund in support of him and that MOVE members supported his defense. What any of this has to do with what happened that night in December of 1981, you'll have to ask them, but it has nothing to do with what, whether he did it or not or who shot Daniel Faulkner that night. That's all about race and making sure that race was an important part of this case before it was tried. We know that once it got into the courtroom, this uh, Mumia's prosecutor made sure that black people didn't get a chance to serve on that jury. Now we know that he did that consistently. Between 81 and 83, the prosecutor in this case excluded African-American prospective jurors almost as three times as often as he excluded prospective white jurors. This was part of a systematic attempt to exclude African-Americans. Now we know that that DA's office had done that consistently during that time and after. The Supreme Court noted in a different case that a comprehensive statistical studies of Philadelphia County death penalty cases tried between 81 and 97 shows that in 317 capital trials, prosecutors struck 51% of black jurors and 26% of non-black jurors. That's Philadelphia County. And we know that the trial judge in this case was overheard saying he was going to help fry the nigger. So this case is all about race. People will tell us that it is not, that this is about the sh simply about the shooting of a police officer. That is not true. The Legal Defense Fund knows that is not true, and that is why we are here today.
So we look forward to working with all of you. I do want to say very clearly, we are a team. I am a team. Everything I do is part and parcel of the work of, an, of a larger group of people. I have the honor and privilege of working with three other attorneys day by day. They are the people who, you know, keep the wheels running. So you will meet them all. They are Joanna Steinberg, Vincent Sutherland, and Jin He Lee. And in the room today we have two outstanding organizers who you will see more than you will see us. Lumumba Bandele, I have the honor to work with. And Lauren Galarza, who's in the back of the room. They will speak for us when I cannot be here, but understand we are always here with you. We are committed to this struggle, and um, I look forward uh, to having a different kind of celebration meeting in the near future.